Ready to go live. Live. Hey, everybody. Hey, everyone. I'm Zach Zovath. I'm Dr. Aaron Zovath, and we're going to get into our webinar on Max Immunity. So the big thing that we're going to cover, we have four concepts to help you understand how the immune system normally functions. We're also going to go through three things that affect normal immune function and the things that you can do for the solutions. So the big thing, you know, that we're going to get into first is a natural immune response. So I want everyone to understand that every second of the day, our, our immune system is working to protect us, and our body is in favor of survival. So every second of the day, our body is constantly making sure that nothing, no pathogens come in, nothing comes in to invade our body. So the, the main way that we think about a pathogen entering the body, we know that if we have a cut, we want to clean it out because otherwise bacteria and different things can get in there. But outside of an injury, um, we also have to make sure that we're protecting areas that microbes can enter on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. So we look at in the, the head and in the face, we have where our, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our nose, that's where different pathogens can enter. But what's really cool is all of those areas are filtered through the throat. And we have an amazing ring of tonsils that are constantly filtering and detecting and determining whether something is a, a good thing that can come into the body and it's fine, or it's detecting if it's a pathogen and if it's something that the body has to react to. So there's actually um, infectious microbes, they release a set of signals that are recognized by the immune system. So right away, the nervous system detects that something isn't supposed to be in there, and immediately an immune response is initiated, as soon as it is actually filtered into the tonsils. So think about how cool that is. Before it gets further into the system, because we know that if an infection is taken care of right away, it's very minimal, mild, but the longer that it progresses and the further into our system it gets, if our body doesn't respond right away, it can get into our lungs and can start to create some long-term more complications um, and secondary infections that can happen when it infiltrates further into the system. Yeah, it makes you think, there was about five, six months ago, we started watching this documentary about Vikings. It's super addictive to get into. In that, that documentary led to us watching this series, Vikings, and you know, it's, it follows these Vikings and how they eventually pursued all of Europe with different raids and, and everything. And, the key thing with that, what makes me think of when you talk about tonsils and that ring, you know, the, the ring of protection for your entire body, is when the Vikings would catch a town off guard and there was no protection, it was an easy raid. They just went in, they slaughtered everybody, they took everything, and they were out. So when they came up to larger cities, people that were or cities that were well defended, they always had somebody with a wall around the city itself and, and people guarding them. So if they ran into this city or this town with a wall or a fortress that was protecting everybody inside it, and the people guarding were doing exactly what they needed to do, it took the Vikings a lot longer if they even got in at all. It was a really, really quick battle, relatively speaking, because the people on guard were able to fight off the invaders and they were able to go about their business. But if somebody were to sneak past or if they were down their forces, they get in, it was so much harder for the town and the city to get the Vikings out, to get the Raiders out once they were already there. So you look at when tonsils are removed and you're doing things that are wearing down your immune system, you're taking the guard off the wall, and then your body has to work so much harder to get those invaders out. Yeah, we right now have an, an epidemic of so many kids that are getting their tonsils removed, and there was a, a big long-term study that followed people that had their tonsils removed as children, and they found out that those people as adults had more long-term uh, complications with respiratory function. Um, whenever they would get sick, they were more prone to uh, really bad respiratory distress that happened because the tonsils were actually meant to protect the body. And if we never figure out what caused, you know, I know people have you know constantly inflamed tonsils, but what we need to look at is what's causing that to happen. Why is the immune system responding that way? We just go to taking them out, but the reality is long-term, we took away the body's wall in the defense and so the battle becomes a lot messier and harder for those people because the body doesn't detect it right away. It doesn't initiate the response. So it tends to progress down. So we're going to be referencing Vikings a lot <laughs> during this because I remember when we watched, when we were really getting into the show, you know, uh, Aaron made that connection of Vikings and how they're, it's like the immune system, how it's fighting it off. And that's really cool. She's always on like that, but we're going to be referencing Vikings a lot talking a lot about the wall we got to hold the wall and how your body is is at a war with 
pathogen and pathogens and things that are trying to be opportunistic. Uh, you know, we're going to go through all those concepts. So I guess in our analogy, Vikings are the pathogens. Yeah, Vikings are the bad. And, and we're dangerous. like Paris with the wall trying to protect it. So our body's immune system is the wall. The tonsils, the guards are the wall. So we don't ever want the Vikings to break down the wall and get further into the system. All right, so we, we're gonna get really deep into this analogy. <laughs> yeah, you guys are all gonna wanna watch this. The documentary was really, really cool. Um, the series got really intense, but- um, It's not PG rated. No, so the documentary is a good way to start. Um, all right, second concept that we're gonna get into is that fever, cough, and sniffles are good for you. And we actually wrote a newsletter about this um, a few years ago when we started. We constantly have this conversation that health is not about how we feel because somebody can feel fine when they have a heart attack. Somebody can feel fine when they get diagnosed with cancer. That health is not about how you feel. Health is about how your body is healing and functioning. So if we look at healing and functioning at 100%, that doesn't always equal feeling good. Now, when you're healthy, the majority of the time your body does feel good, but there's times that the body doesn't feel good, but it's actually healing. So our best example of this is if you have a fever, is a fever good or bad? And we talk about this all the time at workshops, we get a great response of, no, a fever is good. What's a fever doing? A fever is actually getting rid of the infection. It's heating up to kill the infection. So if we understand that a fever is good for us, a fever is actually for us, that's a God-designed mechanism to get rid of an infection. What I want you to think about is, yes, a fever doesn't feel good. It actually feels awful but it's actually a really, really powerful healing tool that the body has. I remember the first time you actually got a fever and it was maybe seven, eight years ago. Well, at this point, 10 years ago, you haven't got it for long enough. Um, first fever and just getting so excited about actually getting a fever because you knew that your body's actually going through the correct healing mechanism. It's yeah. doing what it's supposed to do with for years, uh, it would be I never had a fever until yeah. I was in my 20s. And, so, and it took a lot of progression into uh, things getting a lot worse and needing medication and steroids to help calm down the bleeding issues. So for, for you to get a fever, and, and when you talk about this concept, you know, the easiest way to remember and something you can kind of anchor onto when you're going through not feeling well is that sometimes healing hurts. And you know, that is something that Dr. Tony would say when he was adjusting people. And it's stuck with us. It's such a good thing to anchor onto. Because when your body's healing, sometimes it doesn't feel good. And that's an okay thing because the body's always doing what it's supposed to do. But if you have the fever initiated right away, that's our body's way of holding the wall. It's the way of stopping the bacterial or viral replication. It's allowing that load to come down before it infiltrates further into the system. So if the fever happens right away, it doesn't progress long term. It's more efficient. So even though it doesn't feel good, it's an efficient response. So if right away, as soon as a fever is, is initiating in the body, if we do fever reducing medications, right away we're interfering with the healing response. And then what happens is it takes longer for the body to actually heal. So when I used to come down with something, it was like two weeks that it would take me to get over. A cold would end up turning into bronchitis every single time because my body was never able to hold the wall. So it's an amazing thing to understand that yes, well, the fever might not feel good, it's our body actually healing and, and it's for us. And that's what we, we constantly teach our, our children. So, you know, we look at the fever is actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, what's another example of the so throwing up? Throwing up, so when we talk about fevers are a good thing and that's maybe a little bit easier to wrap your head around when you get a fever, it's a good thing. Nobody likes to throw up. So it's another, it's a really good thing. You think your body is getting something out that it does not want inside. So. If you go to, and this is a, a, a metaphor we've used a lot, if we both eat the same food at the same time, I throw up and you don't, which one is sick? If we ate contaminated food, so say we ate food, chicken that was contaminated with salmonella, and he and throws up, stuff. yeah, if he throws up because he ate chicken with salmonella and I don't throw up, you know, who's the one that's healthy? It's actually the person that threw up immediately because we think about throwing up or a fever as that being sick, but it's actually a healing response. It actually means that your body is healthy and well when it initiates those responses correctly. Uh, looking at when uh, you have mucus. So yes, mucus is really gross and inconvenient to deal with, but it's your body's way of get cleaning up 
the, the you know, dead pathogens, the, um, the microbes, the, the weakened cells that were unfortunately damaged in the, the fight. Your body's getting out a lot of dead Vikings. <laughs> so the, the carnage during the battle, your body has to be able to clean that out. So what the body does is it actually takes all those um, the, the pathogens and everything, the dead weakened cells, cleans it up, and it gets it in this, this mucus in order to expel out of the body. So think about, is a cough good or bad? A cough is actually a good thing because your body is getting out the stuff that it doesn't want in there any longer. So if we take a cough suppressant, while we may feel better because we're not coughing, we're progressing or prolonging the illness because we're interfering with what the body was trying to do to heal. And so, you know, the, the big things that we want to look at is, you know, and I have parents all the time ask, okay, well, when do I know if something is an emergency or not? So, you know, just understand that if we react correctly right away, we hold the wall and it most of the time it never leads to any type of, of complications. The body can efficiently take care of it, but we have to be patient with the body does need time to heal. And we often don't let the body have enough time to be able to work the way that it's supposed to. Um, you know, we, the body has an incredible ability to heal more than what medical science can even explain, you know, more than what medical science can even offer. It's our body's own healing is what is keeping us alive. And while we're extremely thankful for, you know, medicine and emergency care in a crisis situation, what that does is it will stabilize us in a crisis, but still it's up to our body to heal. It's up to our body to actually go through the healing process. No matter what we do from the outside, nothing from the outside heals us. In the end, it's up to our body to do it. And so if we support it correctly, we just have to think logic with our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the big thing that we talk through, you know, if, if we're fighting something off or our kids are fighting something off, just look at, you know, how is the overall demeanor? Like you're going to be more tired when you're fighting something off because you heal and repair when you're sleeping. So we often override this as an adult. Um, yeah, well, and this is something really key to hit on maybe sit out for a little bit because as an adult, you know, we're totally willing to suffer through things uh, and just get through it. You know, as long as we, you know, we watch a bunch of Vikings episodes on the couch, we don't feel well, we'll get through it, we'll get over it. But when it's your kid, uh, everything seems more heightened. Everything seems, you're, you're hyper aware of every little thing that they're going through. They're they just are a little bit off. They're not as crazy as they usually are. They're not as hungry as they usually are. They, they want to cuddle more. They maybe have a little bit of a fever. It's an okay thing to be concerned. It's, it's an expected thing to be concerned when your kids are going through that. It's just, you know, what Dr. Aaron's talking about is allowing their body enough time to do what it needs to do, do what it was created to do, and then know when you need to step in and maybe get some outside intervention. So if we give the body time to heal right away and rest, you know, it's, kids innately know that when they're fighting something off they will sleep like they'll take long naps they're going to sleep in really long they're listening to that innate instinct as adults we override it and say i know i should sleep right now i can feel i'm tired but i have this to do but i have this to do and we run ourselves down and we prolong something um but the biggest thing with kids is just is snuggling them and loving on them and telling them that i know this doesn't feel good right now but your body is so strong your body is healing it's doing exactly what it should it's just loving on them and you know make it watching their demeanor kids will go through ups and downs as they're fighting something off that they may be a little bit you know more tired um, and then their energy picks up and they're playing and you know I parents are like I'm not sure if they're okay you know but I'm watching the kids like run around and be crazy I'm like if something was really wrong in the body what you want to be concerned with is if they're extremely lethargic you know all day long that they don't have any ups and downs out of it you know Again, they're going to be more tired, but I'm talking lethargic that they don't have periods of time that you can make them laugh. They can't even enjoy watching their favorite show. They're just, you know, out of it. That's a time that you want to be concerned. Also, you want to keep up their hydration. Um, a lot of times they don't want to eat. Uh, when you eat, it actually takes a lot of energy to digest food. So when your body is fighting something off, innately your body doesn't really want to eat because it's diverting all its energy towards healing and the immune response. So don't be concerned that, you know, if the kid's, if they're not wanting to eat as much during that time, just keep them hydrated. So we want to keep fluids, not just water, but electrolytes going into their system. So as long as they're still peeing, that they don't go more than eight hours without going um, to the bathroom, and you know, watch that they're it's not super yellow. That means that they're starting to get more dehydrated. I mean, those are the the 
key factors is just being aware. Um, and you have that paternal instinct. You know your kids. You know when oh. you've got your paternal instinct there. But we know with our kids, you know, our, our biggest thing when our kids are fighting something off, we know that if we can keep getting, if we can get them to laugh, so we do something stupid, something silly, and if we can get them to laugh, we know that they're all right, that they're they're fighting through it and they just need some yeah, time. Yeah, we definitely have the snuggle shows that they like, and if they don't want to watch that, we know they really don't feel well. Uh, and this is something where it's it's never anything you want to beat yourself up about if you forget this idea, this concept, because the idea of your body's doing what it's supposed to do, sometimes healing parents, fevers are a good thing. Uh, it's, it's something that's really easy to forget when everything bad is going down around you. Uh, we've gone through it as well, and we actually got called out for it by Jude. We were coming home from the office one day, and I felt terrible. Um, we, I, I remember we stopped at the gas station to get gas. I got out, and Jude just said, you know, what's wrong, Dad? And I said, well, I'm sick. And he looked at me really weird. Like I just spoke a different language. And he's like, but you have a fever, so you're not sick because your body's healing. And I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> just got schooled and how our body's supposed to heal by a then five-year-old. Yeah. And, you know, it, we forget it too. And, and sometimes we need a reminder. So if you're dealing with that, you're not feeling well, and everyone around you is telling you you're sick, call us. We'll tell you your body's amazing, your body's strong, it's doing what it needs to do because that's, what's, that's what the healing process looks like. It's always doing the right thing at the right time. You just have to trust that. Yeah. And we, with our kids, we literally were like their biggest cheerleaders when they're fighting something that – you are strong, good cough. That was amazing. That was an awesome, that was a strong cough. You know, your fever, like your body is doing an amazing job. You're healing, it's so strong. So think about, you know, just those affirmations and what that does even to your mindset and your body knowing that you're gonna overcome something is you're speaking that constant strength into it. So third concept we're gonna get into. 70% um, of your immune system is in your gut. This is a very, very important concept to understand. So it is absolutely important that we are eating the right foods, that we are taking care of ourselves, and that we're working on the microbiome. So one of the biggest things that we want to look at is our microbes. So it's basically the, the group of bacteria that surround our, our, our skin or in our internal body. That bacteria is actually protecting us. So it's pretty crazy when we think about just what's going on within the microbiome. Um, some of the statistics that we have is, uh, it's 70 to 90% of our cells, it's estimated, in our body are non-human. So there's actually more, <laughs> like, there are 70, 90% of the cells in our body are non-human, they're microbes. When you first said that, we've been talking about this for a little while now. The first time you said that, that is mind-blowing. Like, to think that most of our cells, major a big majority of our cells are non-human cells mm -hmm. is... Oh. And what's crazy is the bacteria, if you accumulated all of the bacteria in our body that's just living within us every second of the day, every single day, it weighs about three pounds. So that's the same weight as the brain. So you think about just how big of a deal that the microbiome is actually named. It's, it's a vital organ that keeps you alive. So if you destroyed and you wiped out all of the bacteria in your body, you would literally die. Your body, it's, a, it's an essential, a vital organ that your body needs. Just like your body needs its kidneys, you need your heart, you need your microbiome. So it's just, it's, it's crazy when you think about that perspective. So if you, if you look at, and you go back to that number, 70% of your immune, uh, your immune system is in your gut. Think of all the things that we do to wreck our digestive system, to wreck our gut. And there's a lot that we're going to go through that, that we're doing to hinder this you know, vital area of health. And we're going to also go through the solutions, but you're taking care of your gut is so vitally important for overall health in general, not just immune function, but when we're talking about you know, for this webinar, this is such a key area to focus in on and make sure that you're supporting. Yeah. So if 70% if of our immune system activation is in our gut, I want you to understand how that works. So the, the microbes and the bacteria within our body, it actually protects us from pathogens because they communicate with our nervous system and immune system. So that's what's even crazier, is you have this, these microbes, this, these groups of bacteria that literally talk to our body cells. Like there's this weird, when you think about it, communication that's happening in our body. So they actually communicate with our nervous system and immune cells. Um, and you look at the areas of highest concentration of microbes, 
is entry points within the body. So again, we have the, the ears, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, oh. the vaginal canal, everywhere. So any entry point into the body is has the highest concentration of microbes. So what they're doing is they actually colonate and protect it. So there's it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. We give them a place to live. Um, we feed them with different nutrients and things that we take in and they protect us from, they keep balance in the body. So they protect us from any pathogens coming in and starting to disrupt everything. So, you know, really understanding that, you know, our tonsils we talked about, they, they inventory everything. Um, and so it's important that there's that, that constant communication through the body and that we understand that we're supporting our microbiome appropriately. So big things that interfere with our microbiome, we start to develop it at birth. So immediately when a baby goes through the vaginal canal, it's called the probiotic bulb because they get a huge amount of bacteria that they swallow and it starts to colonate their microbiome. And then that's developing really within the first few years. Um, the first year of life is the most important for that microbiome development. And there are studies finding that if antibiotics are introduced in the first year of life, it can cause long-term complications that their body can never recover from. I mean, that's a, a huge thing that we're finding implications that the, the diversity of microbes in our body, the ancient microbes, are being destroyed now because of the high amount of antibiotic use that we have. So think about with a baby, if in the first year of life, if 70% of the immune system is related to that microbiome, then you can see where we start to have problems with autoimmune issues. So that's where we start to have the, the allergies, the asthma, um, the autoimmune reactions, the gut dysfunction, the reflux, um, you know, babies colicky, gassy, we start to see all of these things that their microbiome isn't where it's supposed to be. And so it's not only the, the antibiotic use, you know, the antibiotics being introduced, but it's also antibiotics that are being found in our food supply. So, I mean, you look at, we talk about all the time at the, you know, top of the dock and the, the meats that we're consuming, but there's antibiotics that are actually found now in the, the food that we're consuming. So this is you know, a, a really big concept to think about when you look at when you're taking in antibiotics unintentionally or intentionally, you know, it, it wrecks the immune system. It doesn't just target specific microbes or bacteria that are bad, you know, with quotes, it gets everything. So the first thing that comes back are the bacteria that are most opportunistic. When you look at it from a, a concept of, you look at antibiotics as this cure-all for anything, you have an ear infection and they have no idea whether it's viral or bacteria, well, they, they just give you antibiotics. But like it, it, most of the time the antibiotics are given, if, if a blood test isn't done to see if, or a culture to see if it's actually bacterial, then that means antibiotics are just being given kind of just proactively, not just assuming that there may be a bacterial infection. But we, when we understand the ramifications of anytime we take antibiotics, the disruption that that creates in the body, we want to few and far between only use those for emergency situations if we fully know that there is a bacterial infection. So I always encourage that, you know, most ear infections are viral and antibiotics are kind of just used as a precautionary. It can be culture. You can ask the pediatrician to actually do a culture. It's more work to do, but you can culture it, find out if it is bacterial. Yes, then antibiotics would be needed. But if it's viral, antibiotics will do nothing for a viral infection. They do nothing. It makes me think when she was uh, working on her bachelor's degree in pre-med, she had a microbiology paper. Oh, yes. right? And it was about um, microbi microbiotic or antibiotic resistance antibiotic and, resistant and microbes. microbes that are becoming antibiotic resistant. Which we're actually seeing happening really bad now. And I wrote this paper uh, back in like 2015. Like yeah. A long time. Yeah. So long. Yes. So she wrote this paper and she ended it perfectly. I actually ended some of my papers in a similar style because it was so good. She said, well, this is, uh, the, we're at an arms race with microbes and this is one race that you can't afford to lose. And so, <laughs> it, boom, drop the mic. And it's one of those things that's really powerful. And we're going through that now, we're seeing that we're creating antibiotic resistant microbes that are just a nightmare to get rid of. Hospitals are dealing with this all the time and they're actually finding now they're having to go back to more ancient forms of medicinal treatments with using things like essential oils and oils doing other things that were used way back when, they're having to go back to it because they've created this resistance with antibiotics. And, you know, this makes me think when we, when we talk about uh, 
antibiotics and the use in the microbiome and what it does to, within the gut. And it makes me think of we've, we've come to this point where we call things good or bad. We say good fats or bad fats. We say good bacteria or bad bacteria. When in reality, everything that you have in your body is supposed to be there just in certain ratios. So if you look at something like you know, years ago when they, I think it was in the 70s, when they removed all the wolves from Yellowstone, uh, it brought in a way to bring the elk population up. You know, they found that within a few years, the elk population would begin to flourish. But because there was no natural predators, those elk would move down into the river beds. They would eat trees that they normally wouldn't eat or eat in that quantity. And then the birds were no, able, were no longer able to use the branches and the other things from that specific tree that they were eating. Uh, beavers actually used the, the willow tree to make dams. And it actually changed the entire topography of Yellowstone National Park by removing wolves. And what they found then, because the elk population got so big, they were competing in other areas with bison for food. And it just it wreaked havoc in that area from an overall standpoint. And you wouldn't think of you know, elk as this bad pathogen. You know, most people would want to see elk flourish. Uh, as a hunter, I love the idea of seeing elk populations being where they should, but they need to be in appropriate ratios. That's why they encourage hunting, to keep the population in check. So when they found that they were creating this disruption in the environment, they added the wolves back and within years, those wolves started hunting elk. They got the elk population back in check naturally. The birds came back to different areas of the forest where they were no longer because the trees were growing differently. The beavers then came back they were able to build dams. They were able to reshape rivers in the entire environment. And then the bison population came back up. So all of these things happened just by allowing nature to do what it was supposed to do, by getting everything back in check and allowing nature to literally take its course. They saw a profound impact on the entire ecosystem of Yellowstone National Forest. And our body is the same way. So when we take an antibiotic, when we're increasing stress and we're not doing the things that we need to do, we're allowing, we're allowing bacteria to get thrown off and move up into the digestive system, move up into the GI and get into areas that it's not supposed to be. The H. pylori is a perfect example. We're supposed to have it, but it's moved up and it's become an opportunistic bacteria that is It's in a place that it's not, yeah, it's, it's moved into a place that it's not supposed to be right. contained. So, you know, that that's such a good analogy of the, the ecosystem. Our body is an ecosystem and it requires balance. And if we do things to change the environment, we start to throw off that balance. And that, that leads us to our, our fourth concept that is going to be the germ theory versus the terrain theory. So terrain, terrain, not train, <laughs> terrain theory. So this is a very, very important concept to talk about because you know, there was a, a period of time that there were, you know, multiple theories as to why disease was created in the body. And the germ theory is the predominating accepted theory that, that really took the limelight. But there's a lot of holes in the germ theory because what the germ theory says is that a microbe, a microbe exposure is what causes disease. So meaning that we're both exposed to a microbe, a, a flu virus, and it's going to make us sick and cause disease. But the major flaw in that theory is you guys all have examples of this happening. Multiple people can be exposed to a microbe, a virus, and not everybody actually comes down with disease from it. So we can have exposure without infection. And this is shown all the time with people actually what's going on right now is there's people that are being exposed to a virus that they have very mild, um, you know, mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. So they're exposed to it, but they're asymptomatic and they actually develop antibodies and never actually get sick as a result of it. And then you have someone else who's exposed to the same microbe and it takes them down, causes disease, all these complications, and can even cause death as a result of it. So the microbe didn't change. The difference was the ecosystem and the terrain that it tried to enter into. So, I mean, I look at, I see this every single day with families that we take care of. You know, families, we, 
we try to be so, you know, when somebody has symptoms, we're like, oh, get away from me. But the reality is, is that in families, you share everything, especially with little kids. They're coughing and spitting and you have bodily fluids all over you all the time. Like you get coughed on. Um, we're, you know, they're sharing drinks between kids. They were, kids were just eating the um, coconut popsicles that they made. All of them were sharing it between yeah. all of them. So, but you see in families where, you know, maybe one child comes down with these really severe symptoms, but all the other kids didn't. So all of the kids were exposed, but one of them actually came down and it actually started to cause disease. So what we have to think of, and I am so proud of all our parents, is that they immediately go to what caused that child's ecosystem to be weak. What was what caused the terrain to be disrupted that allowed the microbe to actually infect them and take over? And all the time, you can really start to think through it. And they'll say, you know what? They haven't been sleeping well. Um, they've been running themselves down. Uh, they've been having, you know, all these practices, have been go, 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 haven't had a chance to rest. They've been more stressed. They have, um, you know, had a fall that started to, you know, cause interference to nervous system function. Um, they were eating bad, so they were eating more treats, and, and we'll get into that component of things. But they know that something weakened that child's body, which is why the infection actually occurred. So, I mean, this is really powerful when you, you think about the role and the control that we have to take fear out of the situation. Yeah, it takes away the, I was at a family gathering, my granddaughter wasn't feeling well, she coughed, I got sick, my granddaughter made me sick. You can't say that anymore because it's, and, and you know, we go back, Jude has these gems all the time, it's what you earn. And we, we talk about this at workshops, good or bad, you earn whatever you have in your life's your health. So if you're prepared, if you're investing in it, you're doing what you need to do, you'll reap the rewards of that. But if you're doing the opposite, you're running yourself down, you're not taking, uh, you're not taking your supplements, you're not eating well, you're overly stressed, you're not getting adjusted, all of those other things set yourself up for when you're exposed to something, you're taking the guards off the wall so that those foreign invaders have an opportunity to take advantage. And then your body has to go into overdrive to get them out. Yeah, and, and that's something that we were reminded of all the time we talk about as a family. We had, probably about six months ago, Jude actually came down with, um, he had a fever for like three days on and off, um, and he just, you know, was like, how come I have a fever and nobody else does? <laughs> and you know, I said, buddy, let's let's talk through it. You know, what did you do to weaken your body or what did you do to, to weaken your immune system? And, you know, he was kind of quiet for a second. I was like, what'd you think of? And he said, you know, I've been staying up late and you've been telling me that I need to get rest, but I've been trying to stay up late every night. So I haven't been sleeping well and I haven't had a chance to heal when I'm sleeping. I said, okay. And he said, I've also been having more healthy treats. So we always talk about that. We we buy healthy treats that don't have chemicals, but some of the healthy treats still have sugar in them. So he knew I was having more healthy treats. And so he had, in, in his mind, you think about how powerful this is to logically think through it. It wasn't just, oh, woe is me. I randomly came down with this. That's not bad luck. It was, no, there was absolutely a reason that you got infected, but we were all exposed and none of us had any type of infection. So. You know, I just I think that's a really powerful understanding because remember the germ theory it is a theory it's never been proven that and there's a lot of flaws and holes in it when you just think about that and I think about how my terrain was weak growing up um, I was on antibiotics probably every three months I was sick all the time and if somebody coughed across the room I'm like crap I'm gonna end up getting sick like if I if I had any exposure I would end up being sick when I was teaching in Orlando we were pregnant with Jude and uh, meningitis went through the school that I was teaching at. Uh, one of the teachers actually had to retire from teaching because she got affected so badly from you know, this meningitis outbreak. Uh, I had a fever for maybe a day or two, and you had a fever for maybe three or four days, but that, that was it. You know, nothing negative like what some of the other teachers and other kids had experienced as a result of that. So I remember when we were in middle school, Meningitis was the big scary disease that everybody had to be afraid of. If you went through, like, you're basically going to die. And, you know, our reality for that is 
It's not true. We have three days on the couch that we watched shows that yeah. didn't feel great. <laughs> that was we watched the whole series, and then we were we were good. Yeah. But then also we went through a period of time that when I was taking my board exams for my license, mm-hmm. I was really stressed out. I was on a high level of stress. I was staying up late, drinking tons of coffee. I was you know studying as much as I could, and he would go teach at school and is around all of these pathogens all the time. So he has this high exposure. But again, his body was well taken care of with the terrain. So he wasn't getting any any infection, but he was bringing that home to me. So this is another issue with the, you know, busting the germ theory is, you know, we we look at it's not just about the, the germ causing this because he was fine and he had exposure, but he would come home to me and we would be, you know, just around each other, we would kiss, we would share drinks. And so I ended up through that time period, remember there was like twice that I came down with a really a really bad cold that it was able to, I was able to stop it before it turned to bronchitis like it used to. Um, but I started the cold and I was like, you know what? Like it was passed on. He's like, yeah, all these kids at school have this right now. It was passed on to me. His body wasn't infected. So again, that disproves the germ theory. He was exposed to the pathogen and it didn't actually make him sick, but yet I was weakened at the time and ended up coming down with those things. So, I mean, that's, that's the, the biggest thing to understand is it's not a bad micro. Otherwise doctors in the ER would be sick 24 yeah. seven. I, you guys know how close I am to patients. Like we're hugging when I'm adjusting you, you're so close to me. I have people all the time that are going through stuff. You know, every flu season, you're probably around people that have the flu and you don't get the flu every single year. And if you do, what you have to think about is I got to fix my terrain. I need to fix my ecosystem because if I'm somebody that comes down with something all the time when I'm exposed to it, that means that my guards are not up. My guards are weak. And so that's what we're going to get into right now is the, the top three things that actually interfere with your immune function and cause the guards to be down and make your wall. Weak. You're going to the Thanksgiving turkey coma. Yeah, it's like the, the guards are sleeping. Which- actually leads us into the number one thing. We go into this, you know, I remember Thanksgiving, you have that picture from, I think you just started dating. You went to Thanksgiving at your, your mom and dad's house. Yeah. And the picture, me and your dad passed out on the recliner and it was turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, like all the desserts yeah. and what, the, the turkey coma. And you look at one of the biggest things that you can do to decrease the immune function is eat things that are going to be inflammatory and suppress our well. So we're going to go through so that one main thing that, that we can see in the immune system is sugar. So if we look at what sugar actually does to the body, um, so this is the scientific part of it. It binds to protein molecules um, through uh, glycation. During this process, it uh, produces advanced glycation end products, and these hinder immune function and trigger disease. So that's the scientific part, but we'll put yeah, this in the <laughs> but I mean, that's really a, an amazing thing to understand the process. So when you, you hear us in the office say, if you're eating sugar, your immune system is going to decrease. That's, we're not just making that up. It's literal science. So yeah, the end products that are produced as your body breaks down sugar actually triggers an inflammatory response. So it triggers pain. When we think of inflammation, that's also going to trigger more pain in the body. Um, but it, it decreases immune function because they start to interfere with the chemical signaling and messengers that need to, it, it makes our guards sleep. It makes our guards weak that when we consume sugar, we're not able to respond the way that we're supposed to and fight. And some studies show about four hours after you consume sugar, your immune system is weakened. So, so think about that. You, you may be exposed, you eat some sugar for the next four hours, whatever you're exposed to your guards are sleeping. So you give four hours that the Vikings can come do damage, do what they need to do. And then your body has to be reacting afterwards. So, I mean, that's so solutions. So we're not talking, when we get into the solutions with that, we're not talking about all carbs in general because carbs are a necessary component when there's fiber along with it. So eating vegetables, eating certain fruits are going to be fine. We're talking specifically an easy action set we can take right away whenever things are going around that may make you more susceptible to having to go into immune immune system overdrive, we want to make sure that we're eliminating refined sugar, we're eliminating 
process in the fine grains and that we're, when we are taking in carbs that we're eating whole carbohydrates with natural fiber. If you're really needing to be very strict, we're going to reduce carbs as much as possible and eliminate things like fruit that are going to be naturally higher in sugar. We're going to eliminate even certain vegetables that are going to be more higher in sugar than things that are going to be high fiber, low glycemic index, and we're going to be taking out even healthy whole grains. Uh, sprouted or not, we want to minimize that if we're really trying to make sure that our body and immune system can function like they're supposed to. So why this is so important, especially right now with everything that's happening in our world. Um, so CNN actually, I'm really impressed the report that they put out. Um, this is one of the only things that I've seen on the news mm -hmm. that even remotely recognizes that we have ability to affect the outcome of the exposure to COVID. Um, so the coronavirus that everyone is, is freaking out about right now. I know we actually went through a good amount of time with this. Um, I actually didn't want to talk about this at all, but I just want to, I, I thought this was really great. So I'm just going to go through some of the, the main points of this. So the, the CNN report, they talked about that social distancing, hand washing, and quarantine can flatten the curve, but what role can food and nutrition play? Um, higher intakes of specific nutrients appear to boost the immune system while low intakes uh, lead to less effective immune responses and higher susceptibility to infection. So stronger immune systems help to fight the virus um, and actually can help patients stay out of the hospital, um, leaving you know, room for those who are in a higher risk category or have comorbidities. Um, you know, one of the reports, that it, it was 98% of the people that are dying from this have one or two uh, comorbidities that they had going on. Um, so nutrients help to reduce excess inflammation and tissue damage that is caused by the virus that's leading to the severe lung injury um, and even death. So think about specific nutrients can help to reduce that inflammatory response of what we're seeing as the really severe complications. You know, I remember 80% of the cases they're finding are mild to no symptoms. So we want to make sure that we control what we can control is if you have exposure, make sure that your body is ready, your guards, your walls up, and then it's very minimal what happens. And there's a lot of control that we can have in this situation if we're doing the right things. So there's the... There was the meme going around online that was talking about the death rate. They say that it's around 1%, uh, 3% in some cases or some studies, finding that no, com no comorbidities is hard for to say. Uh, but then they say, well, imagine somebody offered you a bowl of MMs, and ms 100 m ms and three of them were poisonous. You wouldn't eat those m ms Your response seemed to be, well, if you're trying to protect yourself and increase immune function, you shouldn't be eating any m ms So Yeah, don't eat. Any m ms don't need any sugar right but now. Just to get in some of those key nutrients, uh, some of the nutrients that are have been shown to be more effective in supporting immune function, zinc, selenium, iron, uh, vitamins A, C, D, E, uh, and, and B6 are known uh, through research, no nutrients that are proven to help support immune function. So taking good quality supplements, making sure you're eating nutrient-dense foods, that you're taking trace minerals, all of those things have been proven to support immune function. So we're needing to eat things that are going to be naturally higher in those components. And if we don't eat that much uh, quality food, which we need to eat, then there's supplements for that. Uh, and one of the things that it said, there's no way to determine what cocktail works best for you. Well, there really is if we needed to get specific with biomarker testing and blood testing to see where you're specifically deficient. But in general, just eat quality nutrients, eat quality foods, and Take Wait, I mean, you look at the food that, that God made, so you take, you know, a green leafy vegetable, it has an amazing, huge variety of nutrients right. in it. So, yes, you can supplement if you're severely deficient in one area, but the way that you're covering the broad base of any nutrients that you need is by eating more foods that are made by God, foods that are not processed, packaged, and added nutrients, ones that actually have all of those micronutrients in balance. So we, one of the biggest risk factors we look at with this, this COVID virus is um, that deaths are higher among people that have other conditions. Um, cardiovascular disease and diabetes were the two highest ones um, that put people in the higher risk group. Um, along with people that have compromised immune systems, um, you know, from cancer or, you know, other uh, chronic like lung infections, but cardiovascular disease and diabetes were a huge things that are putting people into a higher risk group. Um, so these are things that cardiovascular disease and diabetes, they actually cause chronic inflammation in the body. Um, and that's going to also lead to, when we talk about the lung infection, an uh, excess uh, um, inflammatory response is what's causing people to die from this. We need to reduce um, those comorbidities. And 
you know, I, I love that this report actually it said beyond measures we're taking to fight the virus in the short term, we also have to reduce the long-term impacts. Preventing and lessening the severity of existing cardiovascular disease and diabetes should be a key tactic that we're looking at in the future. So I look at the memes going around, actually our sister-in-law shared it. Uh, every, is there, they're um, in mandatory stay at home where they're at and she shared this joke that every now and again put on jeans because when you're in quarantine, your workout clothes or pajamas, they, they may give you a false sense of security and it made me you know, come laugh. We have this time period where if you're not able to go outside, you can do one of two things. You can either build health or you can destroy it by your choices. So you have an opportunity if you're at home more, you're doing at home exercises, you you're, cook more. you're investing, yeah, you're, you're investing in things that are making you better rather than burning through an entire series of vitamins. Yeah, I mean, I look at, so yeah, if, if you know that you have cardiovascular disease, you're you know on blood pressure medications, that you've had a past heart attack or stroke, that if you have diabetes, you know right now the part that you can control in not having fear is do the things that you can control and take care of yourself. You know, I have, I, I'm so proud of our patients. We have some patients that, you know, are in those higher risk factor groups and they're working out now. You know, we're posting workouts in the group that they're working out every day. Um, they're eating healthy. They're not having any sugar. They're, they're doing everything they can to support their body right now and continue to see it heal. And what I, I'm excited about coming out of this is I think people are going to have more of a realization that we can't just you know, be on medication while we still have disease going on. We need to correct what's causing it. And, you know, somebody has diabetes and they take medication, while that is important to manage the crisis, long term, we need to fix what's causing the problems and then get off of it. We've had so many patients that their doctors have taken them off of blood pressure medications, diabetes medications, because they fix the terrain, they fix the dysfunction, and they got their body actually in a state of health. And now they're no longer in those risk factor groups right now because it's not always going to be this virus. It's going to be another virus. Every year, every second of the day, our body is exposed to microbes. So the risks never go down. That's why we build health on a continual basis. So, I mean, this it looked at 45% of cardiovascular disease and diabetes uh, deaths are attributed to poor diet. So even without... COVID-19, another study estimated that poor diet kills about 530,000 Americans annually, or nearly 1,500 deaths per day are happening because we're not eating the right things to support our microbiome, to support our ecosystem. We weaken the wall and we end up dying when our body is created to heal. Sickness and disease is not a normal state that our body is supposed to be in. So if you're concerned about getting exposed to any any virus, any bacteria, any pathogen, this needs to create a whole other level, uh, another sense of urgency. You have the ability to support your body, to do what, it, do what it was created to do by taking in the right foods, by eating things that are made by God, less foods made by man. We say we value our health, our actions have to, to really prove it, not our words. So... Uh, second thing that is going to interfere with immune function, we hit on this a little bit, but it's stress. So stress actually decreases the immune function. What it does is it causes our body to go into fight or flight. And what this state is, so if a lion is going to come attack you, a Viking is coming to go we'll stick with the wall. So a Viking is coming to attack, and your brain has to decide for survival, sizing up a situation. Can I fight this person? Or if not, I'm going to run. So fight or flight, it's your body has to determine for survival, how do I get out of this situation alive? And so what the body has to do is divert all of its energy resources to that moment in time what is most important. So it diverts blood flow uh, from internal organs to the arms and the legs to prepare to fight or run. So by diverting blood flow and conserving energy for that, it takes away energy from digestion, from immune function, because honestly, the Viking that's going to kill you is more important than the possible bacteria. So again, your body has to size up the situation. So digestion slows down, immune function slows down, uh, reproductive function slows down. And the, the problem is that's, that's a survival mechanism for a short-term response. But how many of us are stuck in a chronic fight or flight? You know, we're constantly stressed at work. We're constantly stressed with all the stuff, the bills we have to pay, all the things that are going on, emails that have to be answered. And that perceived stress puts the body into a survival setting. 
Now, the only way to get out of fight or flight is to fight or flee. So you have to move. Both of those things require you to move your body. So what do you guys think I'm going to tell you the way that you get out of sympathetic overdrive? That's yeah, where exercise. this guy comes in. So when you talk about that, that fight or flight, when you, you fight something or you flee, it's a huge way to bring down that, that sympathetic response and increase the, parasymp the parasympathetic response so the body can go back into its normal state. Uh, there's a lot of different ideas of how we get this and satisfy this movement. The, the benefits of adding exercise are just stacking up more and more. And when we're talking about exercise, you know, we're not talking about going out and running on the treadmill or getting on a Peloton bike for an hour or two hours. It's very minimal, the amount of time that you need to invest daily to satisfy this requirement. And it's in short bursts of high intensity. So it would be the fight or flight, a short, quick burst, and, and then you would be done. Then you rest and recover. So there, we know that the high intensity interval training has been very popular for years now. And what they're actually finding is that very intensity interval training is become uh, more beneficial in an overall health standpoint because that's more natural for the human body to go through varied levels of intensity in different spurts. So you may have a really short burst, a couple movements where you go as hard and as fast as you can for 20 seconds, you rest and recover for a bit, and then you go through a moderate activity for 30, 40 seconds at a time, then you rest for a little bit longer, and then you go through something that's a little bit more uh, of a recovery type movement where you walk for a period. So getting movement and satisfying it is an important requirement that every single human being has. And when we don't, when we don't satisfy our requirements from a genetic standpoint of exercise, our body adapts and it shifts into the state of constant stress. We see cortisol increase, we see insulin levels become more and more difficult to manage and maintain. We see estrogens increase, we see testosterone come down, growth hormone comes out. All of these things get thrown off by not doing what we're supposed to do. So when we talk about exercise, we're not talking about lifting weights exclusively or only doing cardio. We're constantly moving throughout the day. We're breaking up every hour with some type of movement. And then we're getting short bursts of high intensity. Maybe it's knocking out 10, 15, 20 push-ups, doing a few burpees, getting some squats, swinging a kettlebell, doing something that is physically taxing, but then throughout the day, we're adding in movement. And that has to be part of the routine. And what I think that we're going to see more and more of uh, – coming out of this with coronavirus is that people are going to move a little bit more consistently because our entire routine has been flipped on its ear. Yeah. So if we don't have Life to worry about right this now. nine to five where we have to worry about eight hours that takes up our entire day. We have the ability, if we're working from home, if we're not working at all, you have the absolute ability to carve out some time in your schedule where you place an emphasis, emphasis on movement. And I say movement and not exercise. Because you can always move throughout the day, regardless of what your job will allow you to do. So the other key and important and other key benefit of bringing down stress and another benefit of exercise is that it helps to circulate the lymphatic system. So it's not the answer, but it's going to help your body get more attempts by circulating the blood, circulating white blood cells throughout the entire system versus staying it's at this. more guards constantly moving through the body. Your, your patrol is significantly higher because of the amount of increased heart rate in the respiratory rate. Mm -hmm. So satisfying your, your genetic requirements, and we talk about this all the time, at least once a month, you hear me say exercise is a genetic requirement that every single human being has, we have to satisfy it. And if we don't satisfy it, we're going, to, we're going to suffer the consequences. You know what I'm going to be really excited coming out of this is people like somebody offering them a treat, and they're like, no, thank you, I don't want to look at like be really excited when people start using it anymore. <laughs> Not the virus, the Vikings. <laughs> I don't want to let the Vikings. I, the Vikings. <laughs> I need to guard my wall. I don't want my wall to come down. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we look at with with exercise, it's going to bring you out of sympathetic overdrive, back into parasympathetic balance, rest, digestion, um, you know, our, our reproductive system, our hormones are going to work the way that they're supposed to, our immune function is going to be where it should. And we've got that balance back in our ecosystem. Yeah. Fight or flight is not a bad thing every once in a while, but our body, you know, when we have a stressor, it's, it's survival, but our body needs to overall be able to go back to that parasympathetic balance. That's such a cool thing with the adjustments too. 
you guys know every time you get adjusted, it sends this flood of, of neurological feedback. So think about how much your body can reset if it's been stuck in that chronic fight or flight. When your nervous system is functioning correctly, you actually adapt to stressors better. And that's one thing we hear all the time when people are getting adjusted. They're like, I feel like my life isn't any less stressful, but I handle it better. I feel like I can I can handle everything that's going on because you're you're driving your body out of that sympathetic overdrive all the time. The other component too of managing stress is the mindset side of it. So you know, having a greater appreciation of the things that you're going to be mindful and acknowledging all the feels, whether they're good or bad, acknowledging that is a huge way to promote healing um, in breathing. You know, breathing is a huge component for the mindset side of things. So, you so say, maybe breath every once in a while. You say, uh, you know, I like the saying, just shut your mouth and breathe, because you should be breathing through our nose more throughout the day. And they found that we have uh, nitric oxide receptors in our nasal passages, and when we breathe through our nose, it actually stimulates that much more effectively. We get more opportunity to filter out and process pathogens that we're breathing in when we breathe through our nose versus breathing through our mouth all the time. So taking some time to breathe, being mindful, focusing on the mindset of what you're doing, and just having that present time consciousness where you're taking in breath, you're feeling yourself breathe, filling your your lungs and your diaphragm with oxygen, and then slowly exhaling. That's huge for even bringing down blood pressure. And they found that just taking six quality deep breaths through the nose and then out the mouth is huge for helping to stabilize and normalize blood pressure. Six deep breaths. So you're looking at if you have a four second inhale and a one or two second, let's say two second exhale, we're talking about six seconds, six breaths. It's less than less than a minute that we're, we're telling you to take out of your day. And if you do that, every hour, every half hour, you take some time as a transition into the next thing by taking in a few deep breaths and exhaling powerfully, it's gonna change and help to bring down stress a lot. Uh, Tony Robbins, I remember reading one time, he said, stress is the achiever's word for fear. So if you replace, when you say I'm stressed, and you, you actually replace stress with the word fear, it, it really changes like your mindset and perspective yeah. of what's going on. So, all right. A uh, third way that we interfere with our immune system function is by interference to proper nervous system communication. So our nervous system and immune function are interconnected together. So when we look at what chiropractic care and adjustments do, they actually work to remove inflammation and interference to the nervous system to allow your nervous system to actually communicate better with the rest of the body and allow activation of the immune system to work the way that it's supposed to. So think about, we talked about those guards. The, the way the first, alert, the first guard is alerted is through the nervous system firing when that pathogen enters. So we need to make sure that our nervous system is functioning 100% at its highest level. So all of our neurons are firing the way that they're supposed to. So all of our chemical messengers that are communicating, that our brain and body are communicating. You know, we have to think about your brain is this master control center, but it's got to communicate with the rest of the body. So we start to see when our nervous system isn't functioning well, the number one way that we interfere with proper neurological function is by the spine being damaged. Because if we misalign areas of the spine, now we start to trigger an inflammatory response. We start to interfere with that neurological communication. And we start to have the body not adapting and it's functioning at a higher level. We, we create a stressor into the body. And you know, it, it's pretty crazy when it, when you look at there. There's so much research out there about you know the long-term chiropractic patients. There was a study that was put out. They found that patients who received regular chiropractic care uh, for five or more years had about a 200% increased immune competence compared to people who didn't get adjusted. So people that had been regular chiropractic adjustment for five years had a 200% higher functioning immune system than the average person. How amazing is that to see our body's ecosystem terrain just at such a high level of balance and function that it can self-correct itself when we have neurological system working with it. Should. And I love that study because it goes back to consistency with things. So if you're consistently investing in your health, you're going to see the benefit of it. So it's while one adjustment is powerful from an overall function standpoint, consistent adjustments over a five-year period is when people really see the significant impact and overall increase in immune function. 
So it's not just one adjustment that's going to magically make your immune system do exactly what it needs to do, function at 200% better efficiency than right before that adjustment. It's the consistent chiropractic care that has been proven and shown to have the biggest impact overall. Well, and that, that's a concept that we teach our, our kids all the time is that it's not what you do one time, it's what you consistently do. So our life and success is built on consistency. Like everything that we do, you, you earn it. And you have to earn success in areas of your life. You know, what, what if it's a successful you know career, a successful marriage, a success as a parent, wherever you're looking at success in your life, it's consistency. You know, even building you know your your spiritual growth, it's consistency with getting in the Bible and reading. It's consistency in each area. So that's what we want to work on. Well, there is. I just shared this online uh, not too long ago. It, throwing a bucket of water on a rock just makes the rock wet. But a drip of water every single day for years eventually wears a hole in that rock. So when you look at it, that again, this just goes back to doing things consistently. Consistently moving towards something is always moving towards that thing. Whereas just doing, going out and running as far as you can one day isn't going to do anything but make you sore and probably feel like that and never want to do it again. So consistently get your reps in with exercise, with nutrition, with chiropractic care, with mindset. You do things a little bit consistently where you see a profound impact down the road versus trying to do everything all in one day. Yeah, it's not... You know, if it took time for disease to build and dysfunction, it's going to take some time for it to correct. So, you know, that, that's a big thing that I want you guys to just sit on as we end is that if if we've spent years that disease has been allowed to develop because our ecosystem has been interfered with, you know, just like the Yellowstone analogy, if you let nature do its thing, it finds balance. It's when we come in and interfere is when the balance gets thrown off. So. That's our mindset with everything is if the body isn't healing and functioning at 100%, what's interfering with it? The cause of disease, the normal state of the body is healing and functioning at 100%. So if there's a disease process happening, it means that something is interfering. And our job is to figure out where is interference. Is it interference to the neurological system? Is there damage in your spine? Is there interference nutritionally? Is there interference with toxins in your body? Is there interference because you're not exercising and you're not getting enough oxygen to the tissues? Where is there interference and you know when we understand that concept of things it gives us more peace because we have so much more control than what we're taught there we're, we're pretty much taught that disease is inevitable and there's nothing you can do if you have bad genes but epigenetics has completely disproved that you have the ability 95 percent of disease is lifestyle that means that if you can lifestyle your way into it you can lifestyle your way out of it and that's what i'm so excited for people to, to really be empowered coming out of this scare and this pandemic and this fear that we are in right now. It's we come out of this controlling what we can control. We leave the rest to God. But we come out of this not, we pray with action. We all have action steps that we need to take. If you're in a high risk group, you need to be following those five essentials to a T. Zero sugar, get your adjustments, do everything that you need to do, exercise, get a routine ready. We talk about this time period right now, well, a lot of people aren't able to do their normal life. This is when we sharpen our ax. So if we spend time sharpening our ax, when we go to cut down the tree, it's a lot faster process. So Abraham Lincoln said if he had an hour to cut down a tree, he would sharpen his ax for 50 minutes. We have a time right now to really, really hone everything in and eliminate the things that are just noise and focus on the things that really matter. So if you're watching this on our website if you're on the boldcityhealth.com slash webinar. If you have a question, you scroll down, you can see that contact us. You can ask us specific questions if you're a patient. Uh, if you're not a patient in our office and you want to be, uh, there's a way that you can request an appointment just by clicking out on the side toolbar. You can put your information in uh, and one of our team members will reach out and we'll get you scheduled for a day and time that works best with your schedule. Because with all of this going on right now, Chiropractic is an essential function within the healthcare system. So we'll be open in our office uh, and you have the ability to start something if you haven't yet or continue something if you already have. Also, patients, make sure that you're in our private group on Facebook. It's Bold City 2020. Uh, only patients have access to that. So take full advantage. That's where we share a lot of live videos. It's where we've been posting all of our workouts. Uh, you guys have taking a step to invest in your health. So we want to make sure that we're getting you 
as much additional information that you can get so that you're getting poured into, you're getting filled up, so that you can pour into and fill up the people around you and make sure that you, you guys are sharpening your apps. And Bold City Health is the brand so for that. So get in the group, Bold City 2020. If you're not a patient and you want to get in the group, fill out that request and appointment sheet, get evaluated, see where you're at. Even if it means you're not able to start care at the time, you can gain points and action steps to help support you wherever you're at. Uh, if you're not in Jacksonville, reach out to us and we'll help connect you to one of our Yeah, crisis. there's offices all over the country that we can help connect to. And you know, the goal of with each patient is we sit down, get a history, and figure out what's causing the health issues that aren't healing. Because if you fall and have a cut, you heal. That's what your body's made to do. If you have a chronic health issue that's not getting better and you're having to rely on medication to manage, we need to get down to what's causing it. And we've had you know, a lot of patients right now that they're not worried about themselves in this. They're worried about a friend or a family member or somebody that has you know, these you know, comorbidities or pre-existing conditions and they're in the high risk groups. How we lead them is we get really strong in what we're doing and then we lead by example to come out of this and lead our friends and family to get healthier, to get stronger. So the next time something comes around, because viruses are always going to be here, there is going to be a next time, you're not in that high risk group anymore, that you're healthy, you're strong, and you know that your body is going to be in that percentage of the microbe is not going to infect me. I can have whatever exposure, but I know that my body is going to heal coming out of it. So yeah, we're, we're excited that you guys could hop on and get this information, and we hope this left you with a level of peace, control, and the things that you can. Um, make sure that you guys are in that group. We're going to hold you accountable. We're really pushing you guys during this time period um, to sharpen everything and get better. Love you guys.